Yeah, I'm here. I knew it, God. <laughs> Of course, you know the shepherd's uh, slogan for today is if you're going to persist in being a logical person, you'll have to pay the price. Uh, right. I always paid a price for logic. And uh, just think of the, the terrible cross currents of doubt and confusion and the irritation you suffer from because you happen to be a literate person on top of being a logical person. God, it's terrible. 37 word meaning frustration. Number eight, little Jew Tiger. <laughs> enough culture for tonight. Got to return to life here. Uh, how many teams are going to play in Shea next year? We're going to have everything. I, I, if I can only get booked, and <laughs> maybe I'll join the crowd, you know. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, I, I would also like to take a recognition of the fact that I'm doing this for the record, of course. You realize that there is a certain amount of truth to the fact that a thousand years from now, they may be playing tapes of our time. You know, tapes are very important. It's been the undoing of many things. Maybe I ought to destroy all these tapes so that the civilization that will come will not know what kind of people we were. See, I just continue to report on our time. Just over and over, thousands of tapes we've got here. With continuing... There's no way for civilization to escape it. You think that it's going to be the New York Times that people are going to read a thousand years from now to find out what it was like? I disagree. You're going to be watching old tapes of the Johnny Carson show. And uh, <laughs> that's going to be... <laughs> they said, look at the funny clothes. They said, look at how strange... Look at the strange words they use. What does forsooth mean? Yes, we have <laughs> bananas. But, uh, however, on the... Uh, on the uh, let's say on the culture front, I would like to take recognition of, the, of this guy that was recently reported in the press who spends all of his time piling up dominoes you read about that guy? He goes down in the basement and he has 12 million dominoes and he sets them in fantastic patterns and then he flicks the end dynamo, domino and all the dominoes run around the room falling down. You seen that guy? You have him here. This is going into my pile of trivia. See, there he is. He's got thousands of lines. He puts them in the snake formations and serpentine formations. And uh, he says that his, his, uh, his ambition... He has an ambition. He has, his ambition, he has a, uh, let's see, he has a, uh, mm, let's see, he, uh, he has 11,111 dominoes. And uh, he, he says that it would be worth $30,000 and would take four and one half hours to fall down. This is his ambition, is to have 11,000 dominoes. And so if you can start the end domino, you see, it would take four and one half hours of dominoes. You know, four and a half hours of them just to fall down. All of them. They just keep going round and round and round. That would make a great Andy Warhol movie. You know, just train the cameras on all those dominoes falling, and people would sit for hours with their with their mouths hanging open. And uh, I, I just uh, feel that uh, we've got to take recognition of that. Because uh, it, it, are you going to tell me that the domino stacking is any more nor less silly than, say, uh, marathon dancing? or a goldfish swallowing, or sitting on flagpoles. In fact, there is a madness beginning to set in in our land, which is, uh, could be called the existential surreal madness. And I'm reporting this for the benefit of uh, future historians. Uh, things are beginning to happen uh, very, very gradually that uh, bring, let's say, bring out uh, perhaps parallels with past times. A guy that stacks dominoes and his ambition is to have a four and a half hour domino fall that's great ambition i met a girl the other night out at ursinus college in pennsylvania where i did a show who conceived the concept you might have even heard about it last year of the longest banana split ever made did you ever hear of that and she got teams of students all with various colored T-shirts on. Some had green T-shirts, some had orange T-shirts, and uh, some had blue T-shirts. 
And they did it at the hockey rink with thousands of cheering people. And they made a, a, a banana split over 600 feet long. Now, a real banana split, I'm talking about with ice cream, with the, with the you know, split bananas, with the cherries on it. No, no cherries. She says she does not like cherries on her banana split. So the cherries were out. See, it was her art form, so she could decide what it was. Whipped cream, the whole bit, see. And it had three flavors of syrup on it. Uh, pineapple, strawberry, and just a wee touch of chocolate. And uh, they were debating about marshmallow. They figured that would be a little bit difficult to coordinate. And so <laughs> she sat high up in the stands with a giant bullhorn with her entire team ready. There was the ice cream crowd, and they had 12 scoopers with assistant scoopers. And they carried the, you know, the ice cream uh, uh, big containers around. They had the, it took 150 gallons of ice cream to compose a 600-foot-long banana split, which broke the existing world's record, which up to that time was something like 448 feet. And so, yeah, they wanted to really break it. Now, this is, a, this is the kind of concept that would have been understood by a guy who decided to devote his life to sitting on top of a flagpole. Or uh, they used to have rocking chair contests. People would sit on the porch, and uh, they would have other guys sit around and time them, see who could rock the longest without uh, you know, getting, a, getting a backache or something and finally having been carried off to the emergency ward. 17 straight hours of rocking back and forth. Eventually, your brain starts going back and forth in that sea of brain fluid. <laughs> yeah, they say that a, a, a long-distance rocker, after he's rocked or she's rocked for, say, over 28 hours, begins to get visions. Yeah, you get the psychedelic visions because your brain, you see, is it, you know your brain is suspended in fluid. You know that. And, and as your brain keeps going rocking back, your brain is bobbing up and down like a cork. You know, it keeps going back and forth, and then it starts to develop a rhythm of its own. And God only knows where that'll lead to. It ain't your rhythm, it's its own rhythm. And so uh, ultimately you see all kinds of fantastic visions. They claim this is what Lewis Carroll did before he wrote Alice in Wonderland. He rocked for 14 straight days. So, uh, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to get bombed that are not illegal. Uh, you can, yeah, you can have a friend of yours, say two friends of yours, grab you by the feet. And swing you around, just swing you around like a pendulum for a half an hour, and then uh, gradually lower you to onto the day bed. And my God, you'll be out of your skull for days, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, please. And so, uh, I would like to tonight, uh, if I may, I'd like to salute that man with the with the dominoes. He's going to high school somewhere. Let's see, I have it right here. He's going to. Uh, uh, Marple Newtown High School, wherever Marple Newtown High School is, and uh, he's just uh, he's just an outstanding citizen. He uh, uh, he's contributing to our time. And uh, now I I, uh, I I've been aware of uh, this type of madness uh, from time to time. I as you recall that I saluted a man uh, just a year or so ago who had collected a 17-foot-high ball of tinfoil. For 17 feet high, he was 74 years old. And it, he started at the age of seven collecting tinfoil and did not stop. And now, at the age of 74, he stands proudly beside his 17-foot-high ball of tinfoil, which is out in the backyard of his home someplace in Ohio. And they say the damn thing is so heavy that the entire state of Ohio is sagging in the middle. But that doesn't matter <laughs> what's been sagging for years. It, <laughs> it's just starting to accelerate. It doesn't really matter, you know, one way or the other. You've got to pick your thing. I know one guy, for example, that covered his entire garage, and this is in Hobart, Indiana. He covered his entire garage, which was a two-car garage, with bottle caps. subterranean urge drove him on. What madness compelled him to create an entire edifice of froth? Well, I'll tell you, everybody has a desire. There's no question. This kid here who, who uh, has the domino thing going, there's one little thing that you should know about it. He's now holding public showings, which is to say you can come in the audience there and sit there and cheer while the dominoes fall. <laughs> Which, which says as much about the audience as you know as it says about the guy that puts that up the dominoes. But nevertheless, 
he's he's having public showing, so everybody wants to get in the showbiz, no matter what he does. Uh, showbiz is is uh, today almost like the mother church, and everyone wishes to become anointed. Of course, I mean, you know the old Faustian legend. Remember Faust? Remember Faust selling his soul to the devil? And the old devil showed up there. I played the devil once in the in in a production of Faust here in New York on Broadway. Yeah, and uh, it's a great role uh, because it's a natural role. Uh, it uh, it fulfills a lot of natural tendencies in man. See, and I remember sitting at the desk with Faust, and there was a modern day Faust, and I was looking across the desk, and we had the document out there in front of us. You'll never guess who played the the uh, the role of Faust, Doctor Faust, in this one. Uh, let's put it this way. He's a famous uh, TV series star right now. And uh, the two of us are sitting at this desk. It was uh, at a theater right here in Midtown. Maybe some of you saw it. I occasionally get letters from people who saw it. It was a great show. It really was. It was called A Banquet for the Moon. And uh, I'm sitting here at the desk. I'm the devil. And uh, here's this ancient, elegant-looking scientist. He's got, he's got white hair, and he's got great bags on his He looked like, a little bit like Einstein. And uh, he had had a hand in creating uh, the atomic bomb. That was the whole plot. You see, now at the age of 85 or whatever he was, he was regretting what he had done. Or at least that's what he said. He said he kept saying, oh, whoa, look, well, look at the evils I have brought upon mankind. And uh, I suddenly, and he tries to commit suicide, see, and I suddenly pop up and say, wait a minute, hold it there, buddy. And he says, what, what, what? I said, just a minute, just a minute. Just sit down here for a minute. I have to talk to you. He said, who are you? I said, it doesn't make any difference who I am. It doesn't matter. I have a proposition for you. It's a proposition? No, no. I said, wait a minute now. You're about to kill yourself, right? And he says, yes, yes, yes. I've been so evil in my life. I have made the atomic bomb, and I've done all these evil things. I said, no, wait a minute now. I know why you're, you're really bugged and you're about to kill yourself. I'll tell you why. I know why I have been evil. I said, wait a minute. That's your problem. You haven't been. And in your entire life, you have never once really swung. Spent all your time messing around with test tubes, fooling around the lab, the working around with all those log log desitrig tables, and all those retorts and all that stuff with the slide rules. And now you're 86 years old and you haven't done a damn thing. You haven't even known one unbelievable girl in your whole life. I mean, you know, they made smoke come out of your ears, have you? What do you mean? I said, you know what I mean. I said, that's your regret. You're living in a world of swingers and you ain't never swung. Now it's too late, right? And you, you, you want to pretend like it's the atomic bomb. I'll tell you what your problem is. You just ain't never felt what it's like to let it all go all at once and go all in every direction that you've always wanted to go, right? Well, you don't have to answer that, Mr. Faust. I'll tell you what my proposition is. Here, if you sign this paper right here, all you have to do is sign this paper right here, and I will make you exactly, well, let's say, uh, how about 22 years old with all the stuff that you know now? And you can start all over again, and not only that, I'm going to arrange for you to have such a time as you could never have conceived of in your whole life, and you, I'll guarantee you, you'll really have it, buddy. Would you like to sign? Would you, and, and uh, I mean, no strings attached other than you've got to sign this. Now, you don't have to really read the small, the, the small print there. After all, it's just a lot of, you know, this is our standard contract. Many others have signed it. Would you care to sign now? Now, if you don't wish to sign, if you don't want to swing, now that's all I offer. You'll be 22, and I'll introduce you to a girl, a girl, thousands, any girl. I'll, I'll introduce you. I'll listen, I'll introduce you to girls that you wouldn't need. You can't even imagine the kind of girl. And, oh, and pleasures, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, We've got stuff. We've got stuff that uh, the mind of man has not even conceived of yet. I mean, pleasure. How would you like to invent a new sin, for example? Be the first... You just sign on the dotted line. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. Oh, this is terrible. What are you offering? I, this is awful. This is madness. Well, okay. Madness it might be. 
Doc. But uh, if you think it's madness, I'll just put my little old contract in my briefcase and I will leave. And you can continue with your suicide. Think it over, okay? What a great scene. Is there one among you who would not? <laughs> well, today, of course, see, this play was written a couple of years ago. It'd have to be updated. Today, the play would have to read like this. Wait, oh, hold it. You're about to commit suicide because you say that you, you, you helped create the atomic bomb. Ridiculous. Sit down, Doc. You're 86, right? Right. Okay. I'll tell you what you're great. You're great. The great ill of your life, the thing that bugs you more than anything else. Here you are, 86 years old, and you have never once tasted applause. You have never once, never once has Johnny Carson interviewed you because of the fantastic smash hit you did last night, right? Never once has Paul Newman called you on the phone and said, God, I can hardly wait to get the film rolling, get shooting with you. It's going to be a pleasure to perform with you. Greatest star of them all. How would you like to be a smash big hit number one, the biggest of all male sex stars in the movies? You name it. Movies, films, Broadway, whatever you want to be in. How would you like that? huh? And I can guarantee you not only that you're going to be a big smash, but you're going to get good reviews. You will get rave reviews and you will be called the greatest thing to ever hit the silver screen since Rudolph Valentino, Clark Gable, and Robert Redford. In fact, Barbara Streisand will be glad to have a bit part in your next film. Now, if you don't want to sign, go ahead, commit suicide, buddy. Uh -uh. Go ahead. <laughs> It's up to you. I mean, I'm not going to push you. But we've got this contract. Hey, don't think I'm from William Morris. Oh, no. I ain't from William Morris. I'll tell you what. I own William Morris. In fact, it was one of my contracts that created in the beginning. <laughs> now, uh, all you have to do is sign this contract, and within 30 seconds... You will be 26 years old. You will be six feet two. You will have a 23 inch waist and a 47 inch chest. You will have China blue eyes and you will have a contract to star in the biggest movie ever made in the history of all the movie industry. And more than that, you will have seven leading ladies who will die right on a spot to be allowed to visit you after the day's shooting in your own dressing room for whatever little fun and games that you care to conjure up, right? Would you enjoy that? You'll be on the cover of Newsweek. More than that, Robert Redford will ask you for your autograph. Now, I'm just going to sit here for a while. You're thinking over. I'll give you maybe 30 seconds. You can sign the contract. It's showbiz you want. Let's admit it. Stardom. The sweet taste of applause roaring to the rafters for you. Magnificent sense of standing up there getting the biggest Oscar they've ever given. In fact, the Oscar committee will say there's no point in giving out any other Oscars for anybody this year. The performance that you will have done will have topped everything ever done in the history of the films. <laughs> and, uh, you could start working on your speech right now, your acceptance speech. You have 30 seconds to think it over, friend. And uh, I think that the devil has signed up a few more recruits tonight. And uh, after all... Yeah, oh yeah, you, you know what happened. You want to hear the rest of what happened with him? Well, he did sign, see. He signed. Like Faust always does. I mean, the whole play would be killed if in the beginning of the, you know, the first act, if, if Faust says, no, forget it, I will not, I will not sign up with the devil. At which point, the play is all over. There is no play without the devil. You know, there's a lesson in that for all of us. That could mean that there is no life without the devil. 
<laughs> I never thought of it. Just think of all the roses to the cheeks that Watergate has brought. It's fun. It's millions of records. It gave the comic industry a new shot in the arm. Good Lord. And the publishing industry was lolling, languishing into Watergate. And uh, it's just been great. So the devil has provided us a lot of good things in our time. So don't be entirely bad-mouthing the devil. No, no, I'm talking about the real classical devil. I'm not talking about, you know, those little sects that sit around there wearing those uh, robes and, and burn black candles. I'm talking about the devil. Don't be fooled by these poor little sad people with their little devil worship churches. We're talking about the big devil. The one that makes you do all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, evil could be a lot of things, Fred. It may not even be any of the things we thought it was in the beginning. Wouldn't that be a hell of a note? I mean, it uh, could be that paying your bills is the work of the devil. Because you're encouraging all those guys. They're just selling all that shoddy stuff to you. Who knows? Oh, you see what I'm saying here? It gets, oh, it gets round and round. Yeah, I mean, a, a good family man could wind up, you know, flung down into hell. Because the worst thing that man could do on the face of the globe is to beget other men. You know, people, men, mankind, humankind, human persons. Of uh, what other stripe, he'll greed, race, religion. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. Hooray for the squirrels.